Hebrews 3, 1 to 6. Therefore, brothers, holy ones, saints, you who share in the heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses was also faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone. Indeed, now the builder of all things is God. Moses was faithful in all of God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Okay, so incredibly powerful text. Let's go now and look at the Old Testament context because there's so much going on here with Moses and the relationship uh, with Moses and Jesus. So let's first set, let's orient ourselves with the, with the Old Testament context. So let's go first to Exodus uh, chapter 19 in verses uh, 1 to 9. This is after Israel has already gone out of the land of Egypt. And they're in the wilderness of Sinai, so they're, at, so they're at the mountain of God. So this is where they're at. They're at the mountain of God, God's mountain. And wh while they're there, notice this. Moses, Moses goes up to God. Okay, so, so, Mo so Moses is, is meeting with God. And the Lord is calling to him from the mountain. And now, now look at this specifically. Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob. So here we can say, we can say unequivocally and clearly that Moses is speaking God's word to the people. So what would we call that? If Moses is doing this, he's speaking the word of God to the people. What type of act, what type of activity do we call this? In, in a Philip, okay, messenger, messenger? yeah, ambassador, yeah. So, ambassador, yeah. So we, you no, know, that so that's good. So let's let's write this down. So we could call this uh, ambassador. In, in a Filipino context, someone goes, let's say that Koya Boboy, there's there's something that Koya Boboy wants Koya Henry to do. But you don't go directly. You, you an emissary. Yeah, an emissary. What else though? What, what's the other word that they use? Legal term. Spokesperson. Representative. Yeah. So we could. We're getting there. Representative. Spokesperson. What's that other word? Let's say that. Let's say it's negative. There's a problem. Messenger. Okay. Yeah. Messenger. There, there's a problem though. The problem. Negotiator. Negotiator. Mediator or negotiator. Yeah, mediator. There it is. Mediator. There it is. Well, yeah. So, yeah. So excellent. Yeah. Von, yeah. Mediator. Exactly. So we could say messenger, but really the word I was looking for is me mediator, right? So we're going to see that. So, so Moses is going to the people on behalf of God, right? Everyone sees that there. So even though mediation is not explicitly mentioned, the act is occurring. Does everyone see that? And so this is, this is where theology comes into play because we have all these acts of God, whether it's salvation, whether it's law, whether it, all these different things. And so in theology, we, we have, we just describe those actions in, in categories that we can understand because in fact, that's what's going on. So here, Moses is going on behalf of God as a spokesperson, as a messenger, as a representative to the people. So he is mediating. Okay. And so, uh, Look at the, so this is, here's the content of the first message, right? So this is the, the, the message content, right? And so there's both, we can speak of promise, the past acts. We can think, we can think of future. This, this is a future promise here, right? But it's coming from God. And then th there's also, there's also a, 
uh, condition or command, right? So this is a command. Really, it's couched in a in a condition here, right? So this is a conditional statement. You will be my people if you do these things, okay? So then look at this now. Moses comes to the elders and sets before them all the words that God had commanded him. So here, this is the, the mediation, okay? <laughs> right? This is, he's setting the words. Okay, this is what God said, right? All right. And then look, look at this. It's so powerful. The people answered and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, right? So this is the people's response. So notice this here. Moses reported all the words of the people to the Lord. Looking at the previous context in this context, what can we also say about this? So imagine this is, this is going down to man, if this is, this is going down to man from God. And then what is this here going up? It's like reverse mediation, right? So he's, he's, he's reporting, he's reporting to God. Now, does God know what the people said? Let me ask that question. Obviously the Lord knows what the people are saying, right? Obviously. <laughs> He knows all. It's not like God didn't know. And I, so I, and Noah would say that. So I think here, so this is clearly a, a mediation in the opposite. He's being a mediator in the opposite direction. So he's mediating, for, he, he's, he's, he's speaking on behalf of God to the people, and he's speaking to God on behalf of the people, right? So it, it's working both ways. So God to the people, pe the people to God, okay? Um, and so, so, so obviously here, God knows what the people are saying, but it's this whole process because they're in relationship. Does everyone see that? So, so I think this is very helpful in other places where we're like, did God change his mind or this or that? No, obviously God has an internal plan. All these things are each, but this is, this is part of the, this is part of the redemptive plan of God, right? In time and space, okay? So clearly here we see mediation, okay? And then look at this. The response then is that, Moses, behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak to you and also may believe you forever. So notice this here. Does God speak to the people? Yes or no? Technically, technically speaking. No. No. He comes the people may hear when I speak to you and may believe. So Moses is literally functioning as a representative of the people to God and God to the people. And God is confirming the position of Moses, right? Now, I'm just getting goosebumps now. Perhaps this, right? So behold, I'm coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak to you and believe you forever. Maybe this makes a whole lot more sense when Jesus is baptized and God says, this is my son. <laughs> am I He's speaking. He's, the people are just hearing, but he is speaking to Jesus, the transfiguration. If you, if you could not see now this pointing towards the baptism of, of the Messiah, of the son, of God and his transfiguration. My goodness, so powerful. Why did God say that? Why did God do the baptism? Why does God have, so that we will believe forever. So that we will believe forever. And so here we have Moses typifying what will happen in the future when Jesus comes on the scene. This is all the more egregious when, when the... <laughs> When the Pharisees don't believe, right? The, the, the baptism was literally, this is my new Moses. Hear him, hear his words. Um, moving on later, the words, when Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, so this is again mediation here. Uh, the Lord said, go to the people and consecrate them to today and tomorrow and be ready for the third day. And on the third day, the, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people. Okay. But, but, but they're not drawing near. Does everyone see that? 
Take care not to go up on the mountain, not to touch the edges. Whoever touches the edges of the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall be stoned or shot. He shall not live, man or beast. When the trumpet sounds with a long blast, they shall come up on the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, washed their garments. He said to them, be ready on the third day. Do not go near a woman, okay? But notice here, Moses, Moses is mediating for the people. And at the same time, this is deficient compared to Jesus, right? How powerful is it? We'll see later, or you can study Hebrews. Here, they could not draw near. Only Moses would draw near the presence of God for the people. The author of Hebrews, let us draw near with confidence, with boldness, the throne of grace that we may, be, we, we may re receive mercy. Think about that. And so here we're already seeing we are near the, uh, the, the people are, are represented by a mediator. They're experiencing the presence of God, but there's still this distance. There's still this distance. And so we're slowly starting to see the level of difference, not negative, but good and better between Moses and Jesus's ministry. Okay. Did Moses do some uh, high priest work? Yes. Yeah, so right now, Moses is doing Moses is doing high priestly work in the sense of communicating or interceding for the people. Now it's not in a sinful because they have not yet committed a sin. Later, we, there's other passages I could have chosen. Later, he will actually intercede for the sins of the people. Um, but right here, he's just communicating because the the, the, the the priest would go into the presence of God. He would speak on behalf of, of the people to God and also receive. Is that making sense? And it's not a question. Uh, it's a kind of comment uh, okay, good, regarding good. with your explanation a while, a while ago, sir. That, yeah, it's it is another, I think your answer is very correct, sir. And this also uh, debunked the theory of the, the claim of the Roman Catholic that Mary is a mediator yeah. because he's not equal to Jesus. Because yes. they, they, they claim that Mary is also a mediatrix or a mediator yeah. uh, to, to, between God and to them. So it's, that's why it's very wrong. In, with, Practical. With regards to it, yeah, yeah uh, to, to the context that you were saying a while ago. Excellent. Thank you, sir, for that, that no. explanation. Phenomenal. Phenomenal practical so practical that that <laughs> they will say mary is a mediator she cannot be she cannot be go ahead uh anyone else want to go yeah, before yeah. We go? what yeah. what what i heard about mary the mediator because she is the mother of jesus so in the context of human relationship the mother has more influence over the son so if the wow. son is a very influential person therefore the mother can influence the most influential person through the mother so that's 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 the connection why Mary is being considered the mediator to Jesus, wow. which is which is not biblical, of course, not biblical. Course. Yeah, excellent it's point. And so, so go ahead, someone else. Go ahead. Jesus also is God. That's why he's higher than Mary. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. But you see this. I mean, I mean, the, the Filipino culture is is coming into the Catholic Church. It's influencing theology. You you can see it. You can see it. And for sure, it's beyond Filipino culture. It's 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 the 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 fact that Mary is being exalted is really coming from Rome, but it's really being embraced in the Philippines because of because of that that, that cultural influence. Excellent, really good comments. Okay, let's go on now because we have the giving of the Ten Commandments in Exodus twenty. Let's go to the end, verses eighteen to to twenty one. So so look at this. So. After the giving of the Ten Commandments, notice what's going on here, okay? You have the people see the, the thunder, the flashes of lightning, the sound of the trumpet. So this is, the, this is signifying the presence of God. So they see the presence of God. And, and the, the mountain is smoking. It's terrifying, absolutely terrifying. And look at the people's ref response. They were, they trembled and they were afraid. The, the pure power of God should make everyone terrified. The comparison could be the storm of Yolanda. What, you know, I, I, we were in a, the category three typhoon back in, um, in, in uh, 20, 2019. Terrible typhoon, right? Not nothing to compare to Yolanda. 
I was afraid when I had to go outside to check something. I was so afraid. And that doesn't even compare to Yolanda. And so here the people see the thunder, the flashes of lightning, the, mo the, the mountain is burning, it's smoking. And it says the people were afraid and trembled and stood afar off. And they said to Moses, you speak to us, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. And Moses said to the people, so this is, they're asking for, for Moses to mediate for them because they are terrified of the power of God. And Moses said to the people, do not fear. God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you that you may not sin. So look at this. <laughs> do not fear. Fear. <laughs> so there is, there is a difference here between a, a healthy fear, a healthy reverence, and an unhealthy fear. And what I would argue, the, the difference is that of faith and trust. The critical thing is that a healthy fear has at its source, at its fountain head, faith. But clearly here we see the, the mediating of, the mediation of, of Moses to the people, okay? And, and through the course of history, no prophet in Israel has been compared to Moses. He's been the greatest. He's the one that gave the law. He's, he's the one who was in the presence of God. He mediated for the people. Okay, let's go on now to, um, let's go now uh, to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 18 in verse 15. The Lord, your God, so the Lord, the Lord is doing this, will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. So, so look at this here, the, 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 the prophet, God is raising up the prophet. And so there is this comparison like me. So we can say there's going to be a similarity, right? There's going to be similarity. It's a comparison. So we should be anticipating this. Israel should have been anticipated this. You shall listen to him just as you desired of the Lord, your God at Mount Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, so literally quoting from the passage we just looked at, you shall listen to him just as you desired of the Lord at Mount Horeb on the day of assembly when you said, let me not hear again the voice of my God or see this great fire no more lest I die. So literally, this is a quotation from Exodus 20, literal quotation. And so this is going to happen again. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. So look at this. They are right in what they've spoken. They will die. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth and shall speak to them all that I command him. Whoever will not listen to my words that I shall speak to him, I myself will require of him. I myself will judge him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that have that I have not commanded him to speak, who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. If you say in your heart, how may we know the word the Lord has spoken? So this is the question. When the prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or comes true, that word is the word of the Lord has not spoken. The prophet is spo has spoken presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. And so here we clearly see why when they asked for a sign, the Pharisees asked for a sign. Jesus is like, you are an evil, adulterous, unbelieving people, <laughs> right? Because they didn't believe. They were demanding a sign because if he couldn't give the sign, they would kill him. Does everyone see that? So their demanding of a sign is proof they did not believe, even though Jesus had already done signs, right? What's the first sign that Jesus did before his public ministry? What was the first sign? Turning the wine. Ah, the water to wine. 100%. Before his ministry, he turned the water to wine. Public, very public, very powerful. Did not believe. Already gave the sign. And the, the wildest thing is that he gave them the sign of Jonah. And it happened. And they still didn't believe, right? The sign of, of Jonah. 
the, the son of man will be buried in the earth for three days and rise again. Um, go ahead, Paul, ask your question. Sir, I want to share my, I know, my observation. It rem reminds me on Corinthians that it says that the ministry of, of Moses is the ministry of death and the ministry of Jesus is the ministry of life and spirit. That's yeah. why it, I think it relates. It, it is uh, connected. Yeah, and it's connected in a good and a good and better situation, right? The law of God is good, but in Moses, in the giving of the law, he did not, the spirit was not yet given. And so the reason why it was a ministry of death is because the law was given, but there was no empowerment to save, Biba. The law is given, but there's no, right? Bull Boy knows this. There's no help. You stand or fall by the law. That's it. And so that's why the law is in many ways a ministry of death. It only brings death and condemnation because we cannot do it. But in Christ, the law of spirit and life, because he paid for our sins and he gave us his righteousness. Excellent. Let's go on now. So we have a background context for our primary text for tonight. So let's go ahead and turn back in our Bibles to... Hebrews chapter three, so incredibly powerful, so incredibly powerful. Okay. We're just going to walk, we're going to walk through this text. You can ask questions. You can, you can make an observation. The, the first thing that I see here is this therefore. So let's, let's zoom in on this therefore. And so this is a, this is a connection from the preceding context. So this is going, the preceding context of Hebrews 2 is going to provide the basis then or the foundation for this, this next, for, for Hebrews 3. So this is the basis or the foundation. Is everyone tracking there with me? So what is this basis or foundation? So let's quickly go, if you can look to the left, let's bring up the preceding context. So I'm just going to begin in, in verse 14. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, so this is referring to Jesus, Jesus himself likewise partic partook of the same things. So Jesus, if we can highlight here the preceding context, Jesus is a man. So this is accenting his human, his human nature. And it says here that he partook of the same thing. So he is experiencing the, the suffering and temptation of being a man. Suffering, temptation, and also the, and, and struggles. Jesus has to be a man to, to fulfill the Adamic promise, to undo, undo the, the curse of the law, the curse of Adam, that through death, he might destroy the one who has power over death. That is the devil. So the only power that, that Satan has is through death, and the power of death is the law, right? So Satan is just, the, the power of Satan is the law, is death. And if it's death, we know death is coming from the curse of the law. Everyone tracking there with me? So whenever you see death, there's, there's people will say, oh, we're, we're captive to Satan. No, we're not. Okay. Satan is just using the curse of the law to destroy us, but he has no power over us and to deliver all those who through, through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery for surely it's not the angel that angels that Jesus helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Now from our study last week, who is the offspring of Abraham? <laughs> Come on. Who's the offspring of Abraham? It's those believers. By, yes, those by faith. Otherwise, it has no benefit for us. <laughs> My goodness. It's like a perfect segue. Look at this. Therefore, he had to be like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make atonement for the sins of his people because he himself has suffered and tempted when he is able to help those being tempted. 
So he, in the preceding context, is high priest. He's atoning for pe the people. And, and just to bring out this propitiation idea here, this has two connotations. Number one, canceling guilt. Number two, removing God's wrath. This is all of the work of the high priest. Okay. So this is coming from Hebrews 2 14 to 18. He's high priest. He's suffering. He is a human. He's suffering and he's. He's like us in every way, and he's able to help us who are tempted. So then to what extent can, can we make this comparison? To what extent is he helping us? I think that we see, <laughs> we can see the power then when, when the comparison is made with Moses. Okay, but this is the background. So if I'm preaching this passage, if I'm preaching this passage uh, in, 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 in a sermon, this might be my first major point. Roman numeral number one, the foundation for the text. So let's go on here now. Let's, let, let's look, let's, let's go back and let's look at the text now. So then now we have, now what, what really, what we need to highlight here is that he describes the brothers in several ways. Okay. The first thing I want to say is this, is that this is a, uh, this is an address. And this is awkward in one sense, right? Because you're writing a letter, you're writing a letter and you already are talking to the people, right? In the middle of a letter, there is this address, brothers, right? You could say that this is like a general reference to Christians. That's possible. But I think that the address is connected with, look at this. He had to therefore be, like his brothers in every respect. There is a, 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 a reference to us as brothers, not generally, but in relationship to Jesus. This is Hebrews, uh, this is Hebrews 3, 17. Brothers, the brothers of Jesus. In one sense, that's true, right? He had to be like his brothers in every way. Brothers, consider Jesus. <laughs> and then here's, so let's, let's go, let's go now and let's look at this, this. So that's the first statement. Let's look at this saints idea here. I'm bringing up step Bible here to show you. Now I'm looking at step Bible here. Okay. Maybe this is hard to see. Let me just zoom this up a little bit here. Is everyone tracking there with what I'm saying? So this is, this is signifying, of course, that they're set apart. They're holy to God. And at the same time, it's the second characteristic. So this is why I was having us label the characteristics. So number one, brothers, consider this. Number two, saints, holy ones, holy, holy to God, holy to who? Holy to God, set apart to God. And then look at this, of calling of heaven partakers, partakers or beneficiaries or heirs, right? So look at this here now. Partakers of the heavenly calling. This is a uh, heir. We could talk about heir. We could talk about future. We can talk about status. In Hebrews, the temptation is that they're going to go back to the old way. They're going to go back to the Mosaic law. They're struggling. They don't want to go forward. The author of Hebrews, who I believe is Paul, is reminding them, you're brothers of Jesus Christ. Your, your saints to God, your heir, your inheritance, you're a partaker, you're a beneficiary of the heavenly calling. Consider Moses. <laughs> Isn't that kind of so offensive? That's what they're doing though, right? They want to go back to Moses. And he says here strongly, look at this now, command, the biggest command in the context, command, consider. Who are we to consider? Jesus. We're to consider Jesus. 
And who is Jesus? This is the object. Who is Jesus? Look at the description of Jesus. Yeah, so he is the apostle and the high priest. This is the description of Jesus. One apostle and two high priest. And so here's the thing. I always struggled with looking at this passage because I said, why didn't he say King Jesus and high priest and prophet? Why didn't he say, uh, why didn't he use some other, you know, why did he use apostle and high priest? I always struggle with that. And I did some research and more than one commentary. I'm not going to refer to where, which commentary I held because there's more than one that say this. And um, this is a, an observation here, but look at this here. An apostle is a, right? This is a, this is an ambassador from God to man. And a high priest, watch this. You ready for this? A high priest is man's rep representative man's representative to God. We need both. It's not a one-way street. And what can we say? Big idea here. Two ways. What's that big word that we, that we discussed in the uh, Old Testament Mediator. context? Mediator. Mediator. Come on. Mediator. But look at this. Look at how powerful this is. So Jesus is the sent one from God. But this is dissimilar to all the other apostles that he sent because literally John 3.16, John 3.16, and also Galatians, I think Galatians 4.1, God sent his son the pre-existing son. So this apostleship is implying his divinity. The high priest is suggesting his uh, humanity. And this is accented because of the preceding context of Hebrews 2, 14 to 17, that he is like his brothers in every way. This is so pregnant with information here. Consider Jesus, the apostle of God, the true apostle of God, the true sent one, his son that came into the world to save us of our sins. Our high priest, the one who atones for our sins, gave the sacrifice, is forevermore at the right hand of God interceding for us. And this confession here is none other than our declaration of our faith and trust in in Christ. Consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our faith, not Moses, not Mary, not, not some, not Apollo Kibaloi, not the Pope, not Pope Francis, not angels, a hundred percent, not excellent, not angels. From this verse, we can see the divine nature and human nature working together yes <laughs> yes so a hundred percent excellent these two are working together absolutely so let's go back to the go back to the confession this here. is hypostasis you mentioned hypostasis yeah it's it's the, the hypostatic union yeah it's working together henry you're there you're there let's go quickly the confession here. Here we go. Christ as mediator, uh, 8.7. Come on. Christ in the work of mediation acts according to both natures by each nature doing that which is proper in itself. Apostle, high priest. Yet by reason of the unity of the person, that which is proper to one nature is sometimes in scripture attributed to the person dominated by the other nature. Consider Jesus. <laughs> Come on. This is like perfect. This is, this is, this is perfect here. Okay. You can't get better than this. And so the confession guards and protects us and expounds for us what the scripture is teaching us. Coming back to here, this consider here, this consider is not, oh, just think about it. 
and you know, see what happens. No, this is an idea of thinking, thinking, and submitting. Thinking and submitting. That's the idea of, of what it means to consider. Now look at this, brothers. Look, come on. So we see Jesus as apostle, high priest. Look at this description here. Being faithful. Being faithful. To the one who appointed him. This is to the father. And this is appointed him. This is not that he's being created. This is to his, to his positions, right? As prophet, priest, king. Yeah, and so we can include here apostle. Absolutely. Apostle. Absolutely. 100%. Look at that fundamental, faithful. And notice this here. The faithfulness, and this is for, for, for ministry, this is for ministry leaders. It's not faithfulness to God's ministry. It's faithfulness to God. Because we can be so faithful to, to the ministry that we are, in fact, creating an idol in our ministries. Jesus' faithfulness, fundamentally, it was not to success. All his disciples left him. It was not to, to, to pleasing his family or to someone else. Fundamentally, his faithfulness was to the one who appointed him. And then here we go. Come on, brothers. We have the comparison. The comparison is just as Moses was faithful in God's whole house. Come on. So there's a comparison now with Moses. Moses is the greatest prophet who ever was. Are they the same? Maybe just a little better, right? What's, what's the similarity and dissimilarity with Jesus and Moses, we're going to see that it's not negative and positive, right? Moses is faithful in the whole house. Christ is faithful. So again, we don't want to say bad, good, negative, positive. We want to say good goat, <laughs> good goat. <laughs> Does everyone know what the goat is? Uh, someone tell us what the goat is. Does anyone know about that, that, that expression? What's a goat? Greatest of all time. Goat stands for greatest of all time. Jesus is the goat. <laughs> Come on. Jesus is the goat. Greatest of all time. We have this. This conjunction is an explanatory conjunction. So the call is to consider. And then we're the, the, the Apostle Paul, I believe it's the Apostle Paul. Huge debate. You know, obviously I might be ostracized for that position. But this is now, he's going to, this is the idea, and then this is going to be the explanation. To what level, to what extent is Jesus greater than Moses? So let's go back here so you can see the, the categories here. So we have, we have an explanatory. So here, looking at relationships here, this is the relationship we've, we've just chosen. The idea explanation, okay? And, and the, 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 the key is, is the word for, okay? Um, that's describing the relationship. Now look at this. This one, now, now look carefully at the colors. I'm using purple, not blue. This one has been counted more worthy, has been counted wor worthy of greater glory compared to Moses. So who is the one that's doing the counting? <laughs> Who is the actor here? Someone tell me who the actor is here. God the Father. Ah, God the Father. So Jesus is the object. Jesus is the object. This is Jesus. He's been counted more worthy. So let's let we can rewrite this over here. Let's rewrite this. God has exalted Jesus with more glory than Moses. 
God has exalted Jesus with more glory than Moses. Okay. And to what extent, to what extent this is concerning another comparison and we can think about extent. So Henry and Danny, this is the question is for you. The builder of the house and the house. House, the architect or the builder is greater than the house itself. In, in extent, in degree, and also in quality, in kind. Does everyone understand what I'm saying there? In, in, in quality and in degree. There's no comparison between a building and its builder, between the engineer and the thing he's engineered, between the architect and, 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 and the builder. When, when the architect or the engineer shares the finished product, no one is praising the building. It's off to the side. The car is off to the side and all the praise is given to the builder. And so now there's going to be an explanation of where Jesus fits. There's an explanation here. So this is an, this is an eternal statement here. Every house is built by someone. So look at this, watch this. Okay. One level of, so this is, this is level number. So this is level one, right? Jesus is greater than Moses. Number two, the greater than Moses part is between a builder and a house. Next, next level. You ready for this? Next level, next level comparison. Number three, every house is built by someone. The builder of all things is God. <laughs> oh my goodness. Builder of all things. The builder. So this is, this is, this is, this is next level, level two, level three in comparison. God. Now, now who is Jesus? Okay. Let's, let's go back and look at what the author has already said about Jesus. Let's go really quick to, uh, Kea says the house will not exist without the builder, 100%. The house is dependent upon the builder, 100%. Um, okay, Bond, Bond gets the gold star. Let's go, let's go, to, let's go to our, we're going to go to John 2nd. Let's go first to Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1. Uh, In these last days, he has spoken to us by a son whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he created the world. Jesus is also, as the son, the builder. So when he says the house is built by, every house is built by someone, the builder of all things is God. Jesus is included here. <laughs> Look what else. Look at this. Uh, Hebrews 5. To which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, I have begotten you? Look at this. Hebrews 1.8. But of the son, he says, your throne, O God is forever and ever. So the son is God himself. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness and the scepter of, of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Look at this. And you, again, addressing the son, and you, O Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning and the heavens are the works of your hands. So looking here, this is Hebrews 1 multiple places, one to 114, describes Jesus as the builder of creation. Unequivocally in Hebrews context. But we can also go to John 1, as Bon has brought up. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was with God. The Word was God. In, he was in the beginning with God. Verse 3. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Next level, baby. Come on, next level. Jesus is, has more honor than Moses. The comparison is between a builder of a house and the house. And it's between, so coming here now, human builders and God, the creator. Come on. Uh, in, go, ahead. I, go ahead, do it, go ahead. Okay, uh, Hebrews 3, verse 2 and 3, they should be because uh, many misinterpreted 
on verse 2 that Jesus was subject to the Father because of verse 2. Faithful to him, appointed by him. So it's like Jesus was subject to the Father. So this is the wrong interpretation of some. But verse 3, it proves that Jesus is of equal with the Father because it says Jesus is the builder. Okay. It, it is implied Jesus is also yeah. the builder of the house and also Hebrews chapter 1. No, excellent point. Phenomenal point. So this is why the confession says in, in verse 2, Henry's saying his humanity is being accented in verse 3, in verse 4, and 5 the divinity is being accented. So when someone says, oh, he's submitted to the father, amen, he's a man. He's fulfilling the role of Adam. He's fulfilling the Christ, Abraham's offspring, the offspring of, of David, amen, amen, amen. Now, will you say amen to the fact that he is God himself? He is the creator through whom all things made. Can you say amen to verse five? We can say amen to both. And, and look at this. The fa so, so, so let's finish this up here. And so now he's going to, He's going to give applied illustration. Okay, so this is the, if you can imagine, this is, this is an illustration being given here. This is the illustration, and then he's going to apply it. Moses is faithful in his, his, in his whole house as a servant. So this is the comparison. Moses is faithful as a servant. Christ is faithful as a son. In a father-son relationship, there is equal value. Equal value. Everything the, son, the father has, the son has. He's the heir. All the authority the father has, the son has. So the application here is that Moses is a servant. Christ is the son. And look at this. The, the servant is anticipating the work of Christ. The servant is anticipating the work of Christ. And guess what? So from a biblical theological perspective, how many houses does God have? How many houses? <gasps> One house. One people, right? So here we go down here. We are his house. We are his house if we hold fast confidence and boasting of hope, okay? One people, one house, one plan of salvation from garden to New Jerusalem. So this is why, this is why we've always been saved by faith in Christ. In the Old Testament, in the Old Law, there's, that's, why there's, that's why there is one covenant, we speak of two administrations, old and new. Does everyone see that here? Look at this, the whole house. So, so let's be clear here. Look at the connection. There's only one house of God. So when it comes to debates concerning covenantal theology or dispensational or new covenant, all these different things, you can, you can debate till the cows come home. There's only one house of God. There isn't two plants. God doesn't have two house, a house for Israel and a house, a house for, a house for the church. <laughs> come on. There's only one house and we are the house. If we hold fast to the confidence and boasting and hope. Now, where is faith here? I would expect here. Why no mention of faith? Or maybe faith is there. Can, can you see faith in this context? Tell me where it is, if, if you could imagine. Where do you think faith is? If we hold fast to our... Ah, hold, so we got, we got the faith here. What about this meaning of... How can we... Someone says, what is confidence in boasting and hope? Oh, we're not supposed to boast. How can we further define, how can we further define this? How can we define that confidence and boasting in hope? Be, being sure. Being sure. Yes. Yes. Being sure. 
Any 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 other ways to describe this? Promises. Promises. Yep. The atonement of Christ. Okay. Yeah. So we're getting we're getting warmer. Atonement of Christ. Now, this is what I'm going to say. If we want to answer this question, this is where I'm always going to push you. And we need to, we need to get into these analyses. So what I'm going to say is I want to do a cross-reference analysis in the book of Hebrews to see if Hebrews further defines this. I want to, I want to, to further define this with a cross-reference study, and I'm, and I'm limiting it to Hebrews. I did the searches. We can we could do in a workshop how to do the searches. They're they're not difficult on on step Bible, but so I did I did searches and later in Hebrews we have in ver chapter four verses uh, four fourteen to sixteen. Since we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. So that's close to what we're, we're seeing, right? It's very close. Hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. So look at this. Let us then draw, let us then with confidence, boldness, right? The bottom boldness, draw near the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in time of need. And so there is this, so, so the confidence it's clearly then in our great high priest, Diba. The, the way that, the reason that we, so look at this. So, so everyone can see here. We have a great high priest who passed through the heavens. Because the high priest has passed through the heavens, does everyone see this? That we can, we can draw near with confidence to the throne because he's our high priest. Does everyone see that? So, so here, according to, to Hebrews, Four, 14 to 17, our, our confidence and boasting in hope would be the high priest of Jesus, right? So, so we could say, hold fast to the boasting and our confidence, and we could say, hold fast to Jesus. Does everyone see that there? Does everyone see that? Now, I'm going to get stronger. That's not all we found, okay? So you ready for this? This is, this is going to be crazy. Come on, come on. So we're, we keep looking, we're keep trekking, looking for a further definition of, of, of boldness. And this is why we have to be reading in context. Watch this, watch this, ready for this? So I keep reading, I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm down to here. Let's begin in Hebrews 6, 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself saying, surely I will bless and multiply you. Thus, Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise for people swear by something greater than themselves and all their disputes in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation so when god desired to show us more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose he guaranteed it with an oath so that two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for god to lie we who listen so here we go we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement. Look at this. To hold fast to the hope set before us. There isn't the presence of boldness yet, yet, but there is the presence of holding fast to hope, right? So who is the hope? We have this sure and steadfast anchor of our soul. Hope is a person. Hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. Does everyone see that? A hope enters. Our hope is Jesus. A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So when we further define confidence, boasting in hope, right here, a hope has entered, and that hope is Jesus. That hope is Jesus. So we're not boasting in our faith. We're not boasting in our accomplishments. We're not boasting in our status as pastors or leaders. We are literally our confidence. Hold fast to our confidence. Our confidence is Jesus. And boasting is Jesus. Of hope is Jesus. We are his house if we hold fast to Jesus. 
to Jesus, to Jesus. Our confidence, our boasting, our hope, high priest, apostle, prophet, king. You see how unbelievably offensive and derogatory it is to say, let's pray to Mary. Since she obviously died on the cross for our sins, let's pray to Mary. Since she obviously is our high priest who has gone to the heavenly places and intercedes before us in the presence, that is blasphemy. That is 100% blasphemy. Let's exalt some other leader in the church. Blasphemy. We have one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. So many practical applications we can go with this. So many practical, so many practical applications. So what I would say here is that if, if I'm preaching this sermon, I'm going to close on this. Um, I would really focus on, you could have the, the, the background as, as, number, as number one. You could have this as number one point. You could have this as the number two point, And then this as the number three point, the comparison. This is the command. This is the the basis, maybe <laughs> something like that, right? On the basis of who Jesus is as our high priest, the one who atoned for our sin, the fact that he's a man, the fact that he's God, on, upon this basis, consider and cling to him. Why? Because nothing compares. There is no comparison. He's greater than Moses. And guess what? The comparison between Moses is one of quality and degree, like a, like, like a builder of a house and a house, no comparison. And guess what? It's like comparison, comparing all the human builders to God himself. There is no comparison. And guess what? He is faithful in God's house as a son, and you are part of that house by faith, period. The goat mediator. Always remember, never forget, Jesus is the goat mediator. And Amen. anyone else who tries to give something else to you, you can shove it down their throat because it's offensive. When you see how powerful this is, this is it is offensive. And I understand we need to be long-suffering and merciful 100%. And at the same time, ramming Mary down, Mary's probably broken in heaven about what's, how she's being abused and used. I hope and pray. By the end of the semester, you're going to have 12, you're going to have 12 passages on Christology. It sounds like a great sermon. You know, you have topics on family. You have topics on marriage. You have topics on, on, on evangelism. How about, how about topic on Christ? These are the 12 fundamental truths about Christ. Know it, learn it, live it. Come on. I'm getting a little preachy. I'm sorry. I'm not preaching at you. I'm, 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 I'm empowering you.